Joining me now are Nicholas Glinsman, co-founder of Malmgren Glinsman Partners, and Marco Papich, is chief strategist at the Clock Tower Group. It's good to see you both. Um, Nick, I'll just start with you and, and kind of what's the TikTok you expect here? Well, <clears throat> I've got a slightly different view insofar as if you go back to 2012, 2013 fiscal cliff, um, it was sorted out by Biden and McConnell, who are long-standing, long-term friends. And McConnell seems to step up for Joe Biden quite a bit. Now, McCarthy is unpredictable. He's exposed to the whims of five, six GOP members who could, in effect, remove him. But McConnell has huge power within the GOP. He controls the funding of candidates. Hence, he has a strong ability to facilitate a deal. It's worked before over the end, end of 2012 fiscal cliff. I think we got an announcement in the evening of New Year's Eve. Uh, the market, the equity market had been down uh, quite aggressively. Come the first day of trading in 2013, gap open on the upside. So that's a possibility. I mean, you yeah. know, if, I, if somebody said to me, what's your timeline? Between 10 and 30 days, and then it's all history. So you're feeling a little more sanguine about it, Nick, whereas, Marco, you see a little more risk that things could go wrong here. What, why is that? Well, thank you, Kelly. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Nick. I think the GOP is actually um, has a pretty clear path to resolving the crisis. My concern is that the last time we had the debt ceiling in 2011, the last time this was a big issue, uh, the median voter in the United States was very clear. I mean, the polling was showing that about 70 percent of Americans uh, thought that the debt deficits were the most critical issue for the government to resolve. Today, that's collapsed to 40 percent. So 12 years later, you could argue that the median voter has a completely different view of uh, budget consolidation and austerity. And that's really important because it means that President Biden can push the Republicans to whichever corner he wants. Uh, and I am concerned about that. Now, the good news is the news flow has not supported my view. The news flow has been relatively conciliatory on both sides. So there is hope that, you know, I'm wrong. No, the, the positivity of the news flow is what has me so worried. I mean, it's almost glowing. Oh, McCarthy's, you know, so well supported. Oh, Biden's so good at negotiating. I'm like, why, why are we reading such positive commentary? It's odd. Well, you said maybe it's fine and the stock market's certainly acting that way. But I just wonder if there's many chapters of this yet to be written. One more on this, and then I, I want to ask you both about China. Uh, but, Nick, where, what would your advice be to investors who have to somehow figure out what to do? I mean, are they looking for a, a, an opening to buy stocks here? Or, or what is, what's the action plan? Well, I actually think once this, this gets resolved, you have a trillion dollars of new Treasury issuance. That is a huge vacuuming of liquidity out of, this, out of the markets. And I think, uh, I don't know whether it's contrarian, but I think that vacuuming of liquidity will actually be somewhat negative for the equity market. So I have a slightly different view from the general commentary that, oh, equities are going to rally after the debt ceiling. Uh, gets resolved. Yeah, but uh, we've got a trillion dollars worth of issuance coming up. Plus, quantitative tightening will continue. Uh, other central banks around the world will be withdrawing liquidity. It's going to be uh, quite a hard liquidity environment going forward if everything is resolved in a positive fashion. That's a great point. And again, a Fed that has to consider that among many other factors uh, in debating this rate hike. Let's pivot and talk China for a second. You both have such strong views on it. We've had quite the news flow. We've also had the K-Web K -Web China Internet ETF coming off a seven-week losing streak. That's its worst since the depth of the pandemic. Sentiment on China's growth has turned really negative lately. Meanwhile, Nike CEO John Donahoe spoke with our Sarah Eisen at CNBC's CEO Council Summit last night, and he had a pretty dire warning about U.S.-China relations. I think decoupling is, would be disastrous economically between the U.S. and China or China and, and or European Union. If you really look at the trade flows um, both ways, they play a mutually valuable role. And so, um, you know, again, we believe in global trade and we'll continue to try to do everything we can to support that. Marco, what do you think? I mean, we've talked before about whether Chinese stocks are a great opportunity. And as we kind of move into the, the middle of the year with a lot of headwinds over their economy and, and especially these, these kind of, we'll call them geopolitical risks, what should investors do now? Well, you know, first of all, when I look at China, I think they're stuck in 2009, 2010. Uh, it, it's a situation where consumption is not going to be revived easily. They're going to have to over rely 
over rely on monetary policy and QE, which is negative for currency and positive for stocks, especially the big tech ones that will feed off of disinflationary impulse. Now, when you talk to American investors, they talk geopolitics. I'm on the road here in Canada uh, speaking to clients, um, non-American clients, whether Canada, Australia, the rest of the world. The rest of the world has a different perspective. They're not inundated with this you know, China-US bipolarity, Cold War propaganda. Um, and so they're looking at China as an opportunity. They're looking at it as a tobacco stock with some sin premium to harvest, quite frankly. And so it really depends on where you're sitting and what your perspective is. But I do think that there'll be an opportunity over the, over the short term uh, to play this disinflationary impulse in China, which should be good for uh, large cap tech stocks.